Um, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. If we could, uh, let's get, get the show on the road here, and uh, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. And as, uh, please, yeah, when you have a chance to, to get settled in, that'd be great. I just wanted to um, make sure we can get all of our time in today uh, in, our, in this help talks on child care in British Columbia um, with an emphasis both on research and advocacy and some system transformation, hopefully, on the go. First of all, I just wanted to um, say that we uh, are all grateful here to, uh, to the Musqueam Nation to, that we get to be uh, on their land uh, that they've had that's tra traditional, ancestral, and unceded, and we appreciate that, uh, that we get to meet here on the Point Grey campus on their, on their land. Uh, a couple things for the day, just to, uh, to um, get set up. Um, we're going to have two speakers today, Jane Beach and Linnell Anderson, two of the most foremost uh, child care researchers, not only here in BC, but nationally and even internationally. So we're very excited about that. Um, Jane's going to talk first, then we're going to have a break for some snacks, C come back, Linnell will, will do her presentation and then we'll devote the last half hour to your questions and answers, um, which I'm sure you'll have many of. And um, because we have a whole half an hour for questions and answers, uh, it would be great to hold your questions, write them down if necessary, uh, for the question and answer period in the last half hour. Um, the washrooms are just outside uh, during the break. They're pretty easy to find. Um, so, so uh, maybe we'll just get, uh, just get started. I just wanted to kind of give a bit of a context for why we're here today. Um, for one, uh, child care is a very important topic in its own right, but it's also a topic that not only is more first and foremost than it used to be uh, in our provincial and federal context, but it's also something that that's historically has been part of what HELP has all, uh, always been about. Uh, HELP was founded by two people, um, Clyde Hertzman, who many of you know, and Hillel Goldman, who um, was a co-founder back almost 20 years ago when HELP was founded, uh, now retired. Um, but essentially we had one side on the medical epidemiological side and one side on childcare. Back in the day, back in the early days of HELP, we did a lot of things relating to child care, child care research. Um, Hillel and Paul Kershaw and I uh, did the, the first, I think, still only provincial survey uh, uh, around, around parents' needs around child care. That was 17 years ago. Um, we did a lot of work on family policy. Um, we had this 15 by 15 report that even though it's more than 10 years old, is very current. One of the things about child care or family policy documents you can often do is look at ones from a while ago, and some of the issues are exactly the same as they, they, ever, they ever were, um, just as relevant as ever. So today we're going to um, get two, have two presentations, lots of chance to in interact, I hope, um, to kind of get, uh, set the stage for, um, for uh, understanding child care generally. Uh, that, that'll be Jane's uh, talk. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, what we know about effective early childhood education and care, a context for BC. And then after the break, Linnell will, will, will uh, take it into BC in terms of um, our commitment to system change that we're currently experiencing. So let me just tell you a, t a tiny bit about Jane. Uh, Jane Beach, a person I've been working with for many, many years, um, is a research and policy consultant. She's based in Victoria. And for more than 40 years, she's been working in child and family policy and uh, concentrating on early childhood education and care. She's uh, worked within government in two provincial governments in terms of child care, in municipal government and in voluntary and the private sectors. Um, her consulting work uh, across the board, whether it's government or academic institutions like ours or community organizations or labor groups, she's, uh, she's done the whole range and also the range from the most local to the most international on a whole variety of aspects of child care policy. And so she's a perfect person to kind of introduce the topic today. And I want you to welcome her. Thanks, Barry. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Yes? yes. 
Okay, thanks. I have a small voice, so let me know if I'm getting too quiet. So it's great to be here today, and I really want to thank Barry and others at HELP for organizing this event and for inviting me to come and talk to you. And I'm really excited because this is the first time that um, I'm able to do a presentation on a recent trip I made to Norway where I did a, spent a few weeks really investigating their early childhood education and care system. And uh, there was an amazing amount to learn from that. And so I'm really happy to be able to share some of that with you today. So I'm just going to start with a little overview of what my talk will cover. I know we're talking about, I'm supposed to be talking about effective systems, but I thought in order to do that, it's really important to set the stage about how things work in BC now. And so that will be the first part, like who, who is responsible for what and what are the strengths and weaknesses in our current approach. And then to give you some ideas about effective systems, you know, there's no magic bullet, there's no perfect system anywhere in the world, but there are a number of countries that have managed to achieve universal entitlement to high quality childcare for all families and they have common elements that I'll share with you and then I'm going to use some examples uh, from Norway that I think even though we're not Scandinavia, we're in a completely different context but I think there are a number of lessons that we can apply to our own situation. So just to start with in terms of roles and responsibility, so on the right hand side you'll see these are the key areas that the federal government is responsible for. So they're responsible for maternity and parental benefits and the policies around eligibility for it. Uh, they make pay direct payments to families, such as the, the National Child Benefit, and they have the child care expense deduction, which families can get um, reductions on their income tax, as partial reimbursement for child care costs. Then there are transfer payments to provinces and territories, and right now the big one is the multilateral framework on early learning and childcare. And every province and territory, Quebec's is a little different, but the others have signed agreements and have money to do certain things that both the federal government and the province has agreed to. And BC will receive $153 million over the, the three years of this current agreement, which is actually set to expire soon, but we hear will be renewed. And then they are responsible for early childhood education and care for certain populations, indigenous populations, military families, and new Canadians who are involved in language instruction. So those are the main things that the, that the federal government does. And then on the left side, you'll see the kinds of programs and activities that are here in BC that fall to provincial jurisdiction. So you'll see the maternity and parental leave. So the federal government is responsible for the benefits. Provincial governments are responsible through employment legislation for the leave. So how long a parent is entitled to um, job protected leave after they have a baby or, or adopt a child. And then we have a variety of parenting programs and supports, and some of those are supported financially by the federal government. Um, so a number of parenting programs like Nobody's Perfect and things like that are delivered at the provincial level but um, receive some funding from the federal government. And in BC we have Family Place, Family Resource, and Strong Start programs, uh, programs for children whose parents or caregivers are in attendance with them. And then we have a variety of ch licensed and unlicensed childcare. The, the government, uh, BC, is responsible for the licensed part. So that includes family childcare, full day childcare centers, and preschool, part day preschool programs. And then we have kindergarten. And often kindergarten is left out of the equation of what we're talking about. But if you look internationally, it's always included services and programs for children up to compulsory school. So in my talk, I am going to include that to some degree, but I'll get into a bit more detail about that in a minute. Oh, okay, so what's in a name and why does it matter? We call programs for young children by a variety of names, and it can be very confusing. They all have slightly different contexts. So early child development uh, supports the holistic development of young children 
it generally does not refer to programs that children attend without their parents. So it usually involves a whole range of family supports, and it supports the parent as, as much as the child. Then we have childcare, which can be licensed or unlicensed, and sometimes, unfortunately, illegal. But it's care, primarily it's meant care for children while their parents are working. Then we have early learning and childcare, which is the term that's used much more frequently now. And I'm just going to read how the federal government describes early learning and childcare for the purposes of the multilateral framework. So they say early learning and childcare programs and services are defined as those supporting direct care and early learning for children in settings including but not limited to regulated childcare centers, regulated family childcare homes, early learning centers, preschools, and nursery schools. So that doesn't usually include uh, services in the education system like kindergarten. But this is the term that most provinces are using now. And then in BC, early care and learning um, has, risen, uh, in, has risen to the surface by the coalition wanting to make sure that the care part, as we're talking about early learning and childcare, that care is just as important as the learning part. And then internationally, the term early childhood education and care is used. And that covers the range of services and programs for families and children up until the time they enter school. And so, and that's the term that I'm going to use here. And I'll specify if I'm talking about regulated child care and not the kindergarten component. But that, that's the term that I prefer to use. And so it usually refers to programs that children attend without their parents or caregivers before they enter compulsory school. Though in some countries it's zero to eight to make it a little more complicated, but I'm generally talking today about programs before children start schools, and it usually occurs in a licensed or regulated setting, and it includes kindergarten. And then the childcare component also has the purpose of supporting parents while they work, but it's not the main or only purpose. So in British Columbia, we have a number of ministries that are involved in ECEC. So kindergarten is the responsibility of the Ministry of Education, childcare, preschools are the responsibility of the Ministry of Children and Family Development, and the Ministry of Health is responsible for licensing those childcare facilities. And two very different approaches. Kindergarten in the education system is publicly funded and largely publicly delivered, and childcare is privately delivered and it's usually um, parent pay, you know, user, user pay with some supports for, for lower income families. And we do have very low levels of spending and provision compared to many other countries in the industrialized world. So just a brief description of some of the key differences between ECEC under education and under MCFD, the Ministry of Children and Family Development. So as far as the participation goes, almost 100% of five-year-olds and some four-year-olds attend kindergarten. In childcare, there's enough childcare for about 25% of children. Kindergarten under education is publicly funded, so there are no direct costs to parents, and it's user pay with some public funding for childcare under MCFD. And the cost to parents in kindergarten, well, obviously there is a cost, but it's not a direct out-of-pocket cost to the user that it's uh, paid for through our taxes. Under MCFD, it's the responsibility of the individual parent to pay or to apply for and receive a fee subsidy if they're eligible. And fees can range from nothing if you have an infant in um, a licensed childcare center and you're reasonably low income or moderate income, you may pay nothing, but you can pay as much as $2,650 a month, which I learned a new center in Vancouver just opened and the toddler fees are $2,650, which is more than $30,000 a year for a two-year-old in full-time childcare. <clears throat> Kindergartens and education are um, publicly operated by school boards. And childcare, it's up to individuals, societies, and companies for profit and not for profit to be the employer to operate, to start up. 
and open the facilities and decide where and when they're going to open and close. So in the school system, uh, parents don't have a formal role. Um, it's not intended to support labor force participation, but we find whenever there's a strike of teachers that parents are scrambling for childcare. So it definitely does provide childcare, but it's not its intention to support labor force <coughs> participation. And parents can be involved by volunteering, they can be a member of the PAC, um, but there's no formal role that, and they don't have to be involved if they don't want to. In childcare, um, often they're the employer, they have to form groups to open childcare centers, they um, have huge responsibilities, especially in the, in the nonprofit uh, programs, and it is intended to support labor force participation as well as care for children. And as far as sustainability goes, well, there are always ups and downs in the education system, but you generally know that when your child is five, there'll be a kindergarten for them not too far away. With childcare, it really changes with the political climate. Uh, we're not in a country that has a long-term vision and plan for childcare. It's usually a four-year plan for the mandate of the government in power, and we see it changes considerably depending on what, what that party is. And we have a market approach to childcare, and I'm, that's what I'm going to talk about next. So in the market, the market is like you're a consumer and you're going out, you could be buying a pair of shoes or you could be buying a childcare space, but it's a commodity that, that you're purchasing. And it's completely dependent on individuals and um, organizations to come forward and have it there. So it's not available in any kind of equitable manner. There's very little public planning. In a market system, the role of government, the intention is that the role of government is minimized, that it's as little as possible, that it's a private responsibility with the view that supply and demand will make it there for you. So because it's very expensive, and because there are lots of places where there is nobody who comes forward to say, I'm gonna open a childcare center here, we have what are called childcare deserts. So the map you see is uh, produced by the Center for Policy Alternatives, and they took a look at all the childcare facilities across the country, and where you see green, that's where, the, well, there's nowhere that's really dark green that says everybody has access, and the darker the pink shade, orange shade, the, the less there is um, services in relation to the population. So there are some places where there's virtually nothing for families. And then in a, situ in a market system, uh, things are regulated in a manner that doesn't necessarily support quality. It's a license like you have maybe to open a restaurant and it's the minimum requirement that if you fall below that, you will cause harm. But it's not intended, it's a minimum, absolute minimum requirement. But in uh, countries like ours and in BC, regulation is often thought of as a proxy for quality, that if it's regulated, it has to be good and that just um, is not the case. And it's primarily user pay, and there are some grants and some funding, they come and they go, and um, right now we're in a situation where there's more funding than there has been. There's no guarantee that that will be the case in the future. And there's limited planning, so it's really up to service providers to decide when and where they're going to open and when they're gonna close down. So, if we want something different, then if we look at building a system, there are sort of three main areas that have to be developed at the same time. And so we need to expand, there needs to be the money to do that, to, to create the facilities and to support pa parents so they can use it, and it needs to be high quality. If it's not high quality, it's not good for children. And so you need all of those things to be developed at the same time and based on, built on an established vision, a policy framework, and you really need to have targets and timetables in order to plan and have this happen in the future. What every province and territory tends to do is talk about spaces. We're going to expand by so many spaces, but when you only do that, there's no guarantee that the spaces are gonna be occupied, you have to think about who has access, who can afford them, are they available in an equitable manner, for, are they available for children with disabilities, are they available for new immigrant families, are they available for First Nations families, there's no guarantee of 
It's just get the space, we can tick the box. And then is the staffing appropriate? Is it of high quality and is it sustainable? So when you're only focusing on expansion and not dealing with the others at the same time, you don't end up with a solid sustainable system. However, we do have some strengths in BC. It's not um, that we don't. We have the very strong uh, infrastructure of education and strong public support for that. While we do have independent schools, the majority of, vast majority of children attend public schools in BC. We have uh, a brand new early learning framework which covers children zero to eight. It's only required to be used in Strong Start programs, but it's an excellent document thinking holistically about children and families, and I'd say that's a, that's a real strength we have. Our commitment in BC to reconciliation and building on the knowledge and experiences of First Peoples is a, is a real strength, and we have strong advocates for childcare in a variety of settings. So on a pan-Canadian level, Childcare Now, formerly the Childcare Advocacy Association of Canada, and the Canadian Child Care Federation, and then more locally, we have the Coalition of Child Care Advocates of BC, the Early Childhood Educators of BC, unions, Gen Squeeze, First Call, and a number of others that have all made child care um, high on the priority and getting uh, heard on the public in the public arena. We also have good research capacity in post-secondary institutions, such as right here at UBC with the Human Early Learning Partnership, and there's some childcare research going on at, in other uh, post-secondary institutions as well. And within a market system, there is some high-quality provision. There are definitely some high-quality childcare programs, but they're really dependent on the individual and the organization that's running it. It's not systemic, it, and it's, there's no guarantee. And right now in BC, there is a commitment to, towards universal childcare, and that's a really positive sign, and Linnell will be talking more about how that's unfolding. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about beyond our borders, and there are many countries that have been involved in a variety of studies and have provided statistics to different bodies where comparisons can be made. I'm just gonna to touch on a couple of them, and if anybody's interested in Reading more, I can send a list of good, excellent resources to Barry who can make them available. So in 1989, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is probably the first thing that a num many countries, well, I think there are only four countries that haven't signed on to it, one of which is the United States, and I know Somalia, Sudan, and there's one other one. But most countries have, have um, signed on to it. The degree to which they're implementing those rights for children really vary, but it, it was a good, uh, a good starting point. And then, I think this was in 1996, I believe, so quite some time ago, the European Commission Child Care Network developed these 40 quality targets for child care that really still hold, you know, have stood the test of time. And they're not just about program quality, it's about financing, it's about staffing, it's about administration, it's about the whole range of things. And um, that still is used uh, regularly. And then the Organization uh, for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, has done a thematic review of 20 different countries, early childhood systems, their policy lessons that have been learned from that, and there are a number of subsequent, uh, they're called Strong Start, uh, sorry, starting strong, not strong start, um, uh, topics of quality and other things that have happened since that time. And there's some excellent policy, policy lessons. Canada did participate in the second round of reviews, and that's where we learned that we spend the lowest amount of GDP on childcare than, than any of the other countries reviews, reviewed. And then in 2008, UNICEF did this, uh, it's called the Child Care Transition, and they developed these 10 benchmarks which were intended to be a starting point for discussion about quality. And so there are 10 benchmarks around staffing, ab about the supply, about uh, qualifications of, of educators, about maternity and parental leaves. And again, unfortunately, Canada scored one or right at the bottom um, along with Ireland. 
And then the European countries, the Barcelona objectives and targets where they've actually set targets uh, internationally that their view now is that 33% of children under the age of three and 90% of children over the age of three should have access to full-time childcare. And it has a two-fold approach. One is to support the development of young children and secondarily to support the labor force participation of mothers. And so they track this on a regular basis and have all these charts of, of where the countries are. So they do have a number of common characteristics. The, looking at the countries that did well in the OECD review that scored eight out of or higher the 10 benchmarks for UNICEF, in looking at them, they have some common characteristics. So first of all, childcare, the part that's not part of the school system, doesn't stand by itself, that it's connected to and aligned with maternity and parental benefits, with work and family policy, so it's part of a much broader system and set of supports, not just standing by itself. These countries all have uh, relatively low child poverty rates, and they do planning for the long term. So we, we know that some of the European countries have done very well, but other countries that are more like us, like New Zealand, for example, when they decided they wanted all their staff or their trained staff to have a bachelor degree, they set a 12-year plan, there was a change in government, or two changes of government during that period, but they kept to the path and um, saw, it, saw it through. In some countries that have full coverage, there's a legal entitlement by a child certain age, and it's also required that a parent looking for childcare must have access within a fixed period of time. So you're not on a waiting list for two years to, to get childcare or three years like you, you might be here. And a majority, but not all of the service are publicly delivered. And they're usually delivered by municipalities. But keep in mind in many countries, municipalities also are responsible for the delivery of uh, education as well. So it's, it's the, the same entity, but it's a local government that is responsible. And then in every country, there is some private care, whether it's uh, for-profit or not-for-profit as well, but the majority is publicly delivered. And there are caps on parent fees. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion. We talk about affordable childcare, but what, what does that mean? And so in many countries, there's a cap, um, or it can be a cap on the percentage of the total cost that's borne by government and by parents. And in each of these countries, there's some free provision as well. And it could be for everybody, or it can be for families with, with lower incomes. And we find in these countries, informal childcare is not that it's non-existent, but the use of it is extremely low. We often hear, oh, well, parents need choice. And they, but when you have enough high quality childcare for everybody, they tend to choose regulated childcare. So in terms of staffing, which is a key for quality childcare, you cannot have quality childcare w without um, well-qualified and well-paid staff. So typically, bachelor degrees are now required for the, the highest level of trained staff. Uh, not everybody has to have that qualification, but a percentage do. And talking about working conditions, it's not just about wages, but in the OECD countries that um, looked at how much time childcare staff are spending directly working with children on a day-to-day -day basis, we know here it's pretty well full-time. In these countries, four to six hours a day. So staff, there's a lot, recognition that staff have a lot of other responsibilities besides working with children and it really reduces burnout. So whether they're meeting with parents, whether they're doing planning, whether they're um, doing professional development, those are all recognized as essential parts of the job. And most of the staff are municipal employees, so they're part of, uh, they're unionized, they're well paid, and they set a benchmark for those working in the, in the private sector. And um, there's often legislated support for continuous learning and it's provided to them at no cost. And there are, um, there's a lot of debate about the roles of people working in childcare. And so for example, in BC, some people have to have one per group. If you're working with three to five year olds, you have to have a one year certificate. If you're working with infants, you have to have a, a two year diploma. 
but often you're doing exactly the same job as somebody who might have one course. And that also contributes uh, to low job satisfaction, where in these countries there are much more defined roles. So those who are qualified educators are, are not necessarily setting out snack or sweeping the floors or doing, or doing other duties. So I'm going to talk about Norway because I just went there and it was pretty amazing. Um, but also, unlike the other Nordic countries, it has a fairly high provision of, of uh, private childcare. So 50% is publicly delivered and 50% is privately delivered. And that private delivery breaks down into, there are a lot of parent co-ops, there are quite a few church-run facilities, and there are some private for-profit. There are four organizations that provide um, private for-profit care. And since that is our reality here, um, unlike the other con Scandinavian countries where it's about 85 to 97% in, in Denmark publicly delivered, th this is a mixed system. So first of all, this is a picture I took when I got off the plane. This was the first thing I saw as I was walking to get on the train to go down into the city, was this little entrance for children. Children travel free, and I discovered that many things are free for children. This isn't just about provision of childcare. The value given to children is considerable. You walk down any street and you see it might be a balance beam set up. It might be little balls that kids can climb on, uh, playgrounds everywhere. You go to the tourist center and they have boards, not for parents about what you can do for children, but aimed at children, welcome young visitors. So childhood is really valued. There's a very um, high labor force participation of mothers. 86% of mothers with young children are in the labor force. And the maternity and parental leaves and benefits are aligned with childcare. So you are entitled to, you have an option of taking 49 weeks at full pay, or you can take a longer period, 56 weeks at 80%. And um, then you're entitled to a space when your child is one. Now, not every parent necessarily wants their child in childcare when they're one, so if you choose not to enroll them at one, you can have what's called cash for care, and you w can get money. It roughly equates to about $1,000 a month until your child's second birthday if you choose to stay at home. However, 83% of children ages one and two are, are in full-time childcare. Now, depending on the time of year your child in board, is born, it's a bit complicated, it's kind of like school. If you're born in, you know, by a certain point in the year, you're entitled, it's mostly September that children start childcare when they're one. But if they were born in December, they'd be nine months. So when your child is one and you're entitled to that space in December, there might not be a space immediately available. So if you want to go back to work, you can use that cash for care to hire a, a, an informal caregiver until the time that you, you get a space, but usually people aren't waiting more than a month or so. Um, there are many workplace leaves and benefits. First of all, everybody's entitled to five weeks paid vacation. You get, uh, if you have one child, each parent is entitled to 10 days of leave if your child is sick or you have an appointment or you wanna go visit their childcare center. And um, the other thing I learned very quickly was don't set a meeting with anybody in Norway at four o'clock in the afternoon because by five o'clock, everybody's gone home. They really believe that family life is really important and you, people work reasonable hours there. And what amazes me is with all these leaves and everybody going home before five o'clock, how are they such a productive country? But when they're there, they work hard and then, um, then they leave for their family. So every childcare center I visited closed at five o'clock. And um, they d have chosen not to have extended hour childcare. They tried it for a while, but they thought it was much better if a parent could be at home with their child and not be working. They, I mean, clearly there's shift work there, but their um, employers, it's a whole different relationship with employers. There's huge trust between employees and employers. There's much less supervision of people. And if you um, have a young child, so I know here, 
um, if you're in a unionized environment in a shift working situation, often it's the people with the most seniority who don't have young children who get the preferred shifts, and it's often parents with young families who have those unenviable hours. But in Norway, first of all, if you work the night shift, you get a premium, so you're paid more, and secondly, you're working fewer hours. So the older people like those shifts, and so it's much easier for a younger person to get a day shift. So it's really thought through about how work relates to, to work and family life. So parents do have real choices. And 91% of children, one to five, are in full-time childcare. That's the, that's the parent's choice. So looking at the components of the system, so unlike us, they do have a national department of education and research. We do, we're one of the very few countries in the world that has no federal department of education or any department that um, would be responsible for early childhood education and care. They have a beautiful uh, framework plan for kindergarten. It's very short. Each one gets shorter and shorter. It's available in English online if you want to look at it. But it's enshrined in legislation. So what's in the framework is legislated. And it, it clearly uh, sets out roles for what educators are responsible for. And it has beautiful language in it about children um, you know, having a right to a happy childhood, focusing on friendship. And um, you know, they're, they're much less worried about children's um, you know, traditional preparation for school. So municipalities have the responsibility to ensure that there's childcare there for every child. And they get block funding from the uh, national government, and they also contribute funding themselves. And they have to ensure there's adequate supply. So about 50% are directly run by municipal governments, and the others are, are as I mentioned earlier, privately operated. And then there's a, a middle level of gov government, the governorates, and they oversee the municipalities. And so it's largely a paper exercise, so all the statistics have to go to the to the county and they review that yes, all these children uh, have access to childcare, it's following the, the legislation. And then there's this very interesting body that's called an executive arm of government, but it's not actually government, called the Norwegian Directorate um, for Education and Training. And they are responsible for ensuring that government regulation and policy is in place. And so they do education, they do um, a lot of statistical analyses. And what I was really impressed with, every or twice a year, they take um, information from a whole bunch of academic journals and research and put it in user-friendly language and make it available for all staff so that they're not having to um, you know, wade, wade through complex studies and reports that is put in, in plain language uh, for, for, for their benefit. There's also a National Committee of Parents that are appointed um, by the government, and it's to ensure that government hears the voice of parents in their plans. So I um, had an opportunity to meet with them while I was there, and they were focusing on um, the food in childcare, which was, was interesting. You know, I think Norway has done amazing things, but they're not perfect. And the issue of provision of food in childcare, the parent committee didn't think it was equitable because in some centers, parents had to bring their own food, in some, the centers provided it, but it was pretty basic. And in others, they had you know fancy kitchens and gourmet meals. And so they wanted that to be more equitable. And just like most of us, they were also um, focusing on children's mental health and bullying. But very active, and they were assigned two senior advisors from within government to, to support their work. The other thing is there are very high rates of unionization. And unlike here, um, it's not an organization that gets unionized. There are unions that represent various sectors and each individual has the right to belong to their union. So about 80% of the, um, they're called kindergarten teachers, the, the sort of the trained educators belong to, the, um, belong to their union. So there's no sort of organizing of a, of a workplace that's, that's required. And I, I, couldn't quite wrap my head around how bargaining worked. I met with both unions, but that's a whole other study. <laughs> so they, um, I just want to show you the slides. So first of all, Statistics Norway keeps amazing stats on kids. 
They can tell you how many children who are two years old come from immigrant families that are not, of, you know, that don't speak English or Danish or Swedish. Um, well, of course, Norwegian, but um, don't speak those languages. And they, uh, how many were born here or born elsewhere? Really great stats. But what this shows you is the darker green. So starting in 1990. That's what the coverage was like. Um, it was, I forget what percentage it was, but it was pretty low. And then in, the, in 2004, this minister of, the Minister of Education, who we also got a chance to meet with, who was just incredible. She'd been the, the first female finance minister in Norway. She was a, in the Socialist Party that didn't form government, but like many European countries, they had a coalition government, and she was the Minister of Finance from a, for, a socialist government in a, you know, a socialist party that wasn't in government was pretty amazing. So when she was that minister, she figured we can pay for childcare and we should. And so then she was the minister of education. And you see that really rapid growth there. They implemented universal access to childcare in a really short period of time. Like it didn't take 50 years. It, was done um, you know, in roughly 10 years. And so how they plan for childcare, it's not we're going to create so many spaces. It's, well, what's the population going to look like and plan? So you see over to 2040, that's their population plan based on also immigration patterns and various things. And that's what they use. So they do, it is now a legal entitlement from the time you're one. But you know, they do build new communities. Population might expand. So, they still are building new child cares here and there, but you know it's 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 planned very simply based on on the population. So for families, so 84 percent of children that are younger than three years old are in informal child care, and 97 percent of children three to five. So that's about the same percentage of five-year-olds here who who are in kindergarten. So child care in Norway is called kindergarten. So uh, I know it. I probably should have used the word childcare there. And there's a maximum fee, which is roughly $400 a month. But if you're there, if you earn less than about $90,000 a year, now you have to appreciate that Norway has very high cost of living and wages are higher than they that typically are here, but it's still not low income. You are entitled to um, a percentage of free care from the time your child is three years old, that's 20 hours a week. But you're also, if your child is there full time, a reduced rate. So you're paying less than the $400. You get a 30% reduction for, thanks, Barry. I have to speed up. I'm almost out of time. Um, so maximum of 6% of your household income. You get a reduction to 30% 30, 30 for your second child and 50 for the third. And I've already talked about the work family balance. I'll so the pedagogical leaders and kindergarten teachers there have to have a bachelor's degree. And then there's a degree of skilled worker, which is kind of interesting, where in upper secondary school, you do a year um, in your last year of high school where you're studying early childhood education. Then you go work for a year, two years in a center. Then you go back to school post-secondary for a year. And then you write an exam. And then you're a skilled worker. And those are the two main types. There are some. A few assistants with no, ed no formal education, but not many. Post-secondary education, there are no tuition fees. So it's much easier to get educated. And, um, so, and it's a very highly educated population. So all staff have a right to belong to a union. And the wages are not much lower than they are for, for school teachers. They're, they are less, but not a, a lot less. So this is about what it equates to in Canadian dollars, and that there are defined roles for the staff. And then for children, things like, th this is from the framework that kindergarten shall respect the intrinsic value of childhood, which I just love. And that it's guided, everything is guided by the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, that children shall be able to experience um, democratic participation. So every center I visited made a point of saying that children really have a lot of input into what's going on in their, in their center. And the fact that so children shall learn to look after themselves, each other, and nature. Like it's just so simple and so profound at the same time. So just a few pictures to share with you before I wrap up. So these are from programs that I visited. These two-year-olds with the whale, um, they were studying the impact of plastic on the ocean. And so the whale is filled with little plastic containers. 
and in a different center they were learning about their rights under the UN Convention. Children are entitled to know what their rights are and so this child uh, was talking about the right to rest. And so uh, the translation underneath is something like um, sleeping in bed with mummy and daddy and Philippe. And I don't know if Philippe is a sibling or an, a pet, but um, so they talk about their rights and then they discuss what it means to them and it, it's quite lovely. I didn't visit this uh, uh, thing on the, on the left, which is um, a storytelling hut. But I did see every place I visited had fire pits and kids do spend a lot of time around fire. You can see here children using knives, which we'd be appalled at. But they really believe children are competent and capable and they have faith in their ability to do things, they're guided, but um, you know, if a child cuts himself, it's no big deal. They will learn from that. But that little story hut I just thought was quite beautiful. This uh, left, this is the playground at one of the centers I visited, and that's it. They have a few loose, <coughs> loose parts that children can, you know, planks of wood and things that kids can put up. And every child, um, it's also in the framework, they go to the forest to, uh, at least twice a week. I thought this was the forest. They said, no, 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 this is just our playground. We go to the real forest as well, which is a walk away and things like children climbing trees. and. One parent that I met with said, well, I, what's really important to me is that my child learns to put on their snowsuit because, you know, they have very cold winters in Norway and they really focus on practical life skills and the outdoors is so important that the guideline, it's not a regulation, but the guideline is that the outdoor space must be six times larger than the indoor space. So, hence you have, they're not all like this. I, and, I would like to say an argument that we hear all the time, when you have too much state involvement, everything's the same. Well, every center I visited was completely different. And parents get to choose. So when your child turns in the year, before, in March of the year that your child is hoping to go to um, childcare in September, you get to choose, depending on the municipality, between three and seven places. One dad said to me, well, his only disappointment was he didn't get his first choice, so now he had to drive five minutes to get to his child care center. And, um, yeah. So do I have time for my aha moment? Five minutes? Okay. So I was trying to understand while I was there about how did they get to be this society. And I know they have a long history of, of being a social welfare state, but the way they've embraced childhood and children so I went to the Resistance Museum. I didn't know very much about the occupation of Norway during the Second World War. And what struck me was how the whole country came together and worked in a collaborative manner in these underground resistance movements. And this, this in a display case. So as you can see, that's a, a set of upper dentures. So this. Norwegian, this highly ranked Norwegian military officer was a prisoner of war and working with his fellow prisoners, they used his upper dentures to wire it up to be able to listen to the BBC to follow the war effort. And somehow I thought, okay, well, it's ingenuity, it's collaboration, it's commitment, and it's also compromise because nothing's perfect and this poor guy had to do without his teeth. But that's what, what to me strikes me about the society and how childcare and you know, early childhood education and care is, is considered. And it struck me that there's a real difference between innovation, which we're all on about in Canada, which is always looking for something new, and ingenuity, which is really coming up with solutions to really complex problems. And I think that's what they do, they do so well there. And it, it isn't perfect, but sort of on reflection now at home, seeing that there's support across all political parties and that things have moved in a straight, you know, upward direction. There's high societal support. Nobody thinks that this isn't good for children, that this is not what ch where children belong. And there's ongoing reflection and commitment to enhancing quality. In Canada, all our governments always want to say, we're great, we're the best, look at how, what we've done for childcare. It's like reading a press release. And here, they invited the OECD to come back in 2016 to see how far they'd come to uh, achieve the recommendations that the OECD made to them in the first review in 2001. 
So they're always improving and reflecting and ensuring access through effective government and funding. So just to leave you with this thought that um, I love from this American poet, that a good question is never answered. It's not a bolt to be tightened into place, but a seed to be planted and to bear more seed toward hope of greening the landscape of idea so that you, you don't just check the box. When you've got universal high quality childcare, it's never done that you're always reflecting on how can we improve and what do we know now that we didn't know before and make things better. And um, I, it was just such a huge privilege to go to Norway and I think there are many things that we could apply in the Canadian context in our own systems. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Jane. Actually, I uh, arranged it so we had just a, a few minutes before we're taking our break so that uh, anybody who has a burning question before our half-hour question-answer session, um, this is your, a chance. Okay, I see your um, hand up right there. And, okay. Um, Hi, uh, my name is Taylor. I'm just wondering, uh, will this PowerPoint be posted online? Okay, where can I find it? What's that? Where would I be able to find it? Perfect. That's everything. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi, Jane. My name is Jennifer Lloyd. I'm an old friend of HELP. And I have met you before yep. in the past. Nice to see your face again. Uh, I'm struck by the particular context that we find ourselves here in the Lower Mainland. and I'm. I heard Paul's voice back there, and I always think that I'm always inspired by the work that he talks about, but also we, I, mean, I think we have to keep in mind the current socio-political context that we live in here in British Columbia at this time, particularly in the Lower Mainland, with housing prices being what they are. Um, we can see there's cuts to public education that are having deleterious effects for kids and what have you. Um, I've had the benefit of raising two kids and working part-time while I do it. Um, but as a result, I've been to the family places, I've been to preschools, I've seen how nannies are operating, how parents are operating. And I think anybody who is the slightest bit compassionate knows it's a very stressful time to be raising kids because of all these different competing contexts. So with that said, I was wondering that if there's anybody who remains unconvinced about the importance of this approach to childcare, I was wondering if you can see any benefit to reframing the need for childcare, less of an issue of when it being convenience, but actually the more time a child spends in these stressful piecemeal kinds of arrangements that a lot of families find themselves in, it's actually increased time in poverty, whether it be time poverty, emotional poverty, financial poverty, and I'm wondering if there could perhaps be more traction in the political arena reframing it as an issue time and spent in poverty. Well, yes. Um, I also, just sort of looking at these, these other countries and because, you know, I was trying to figure out what to talk about and not because there's way too much to talk about in 45 minutes, is where they've been successful, they've moved from all these other reasons that countries invest. So people, countries invest, whether it's to support labor force participation, whether it's to, um, you know, ensure equitable equity for new Canadians, whether it's for um, school readiness reasons, whether it's the economic argument that you put money in today, your child will be a better widget maker that contributes in the future. But it's when it uh, became a child's right. Um, from, so all the countries that have been really successful have taken that approach. And part of that child's right, obviously, is to not live in poverty. But uh, um, the only thing I suggest about focusing on it being an only an anti-poverty measure is then often it's an excuse for targeted programs. And we know that universality and you know, proportionate universality um, it, you know, is definitely the way to go rather than it being simply a poverty reduction. But yes. And I should clarify, when I refer to poverty, I mean broadening Broad, the definition yes. of what we refer but, to but as poverty. Also, you have to put things in simple terms uh, I mean, one of the things also that I would like to have talked about was the fact that we don't have um, really a lot of informed policymakers, you know, with good content expertise like they do in these other countries as well. So you have to keep things simple and we're kind of reinventing the wheel all the time. So the message, 
can't be misunderstood in any way, and I think a child's right is pretty hard to misunderstand. Um, anybody have a question up here? Nope. So far, okay. Anybody? Okay, well, I'll tell you what then. Oh, let's. A question over oh, here. sorry. Thank you. I was going for a long one, but uh, th uh, thank you for the, for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering, uh, how is the parent education, um, uh, you know, concept is being um, churned through in Norway um, in terms of, uh, let's say, are there any support for new parents um, as to how they should raise their kids, um, you know, any sort of support from Norway perspective? Yes. Um, first of all, I think because childhood is so valued now that it, it's just part of society. But when you do have a new baby, you know, the public health comes, they visit you at home, um, and if you need more than one visit, they come back. They, there are things called open kindergartens that are largely used by parents on maternity leave where they can c go and get information, education, and also a place kind of like our drop-in programs here. And that's, so they're not intended to be for parents because they can't find childcare because they can, but to, to support them. And in some of the more vulnerable communities, what they've done is, um, in Oslo in particular, they um, have social workers and other trained professionals that are not kindergarten teachers that become part of the childcare team. So they're known to families who might need extra support. It's not a threatening or frightening situation to have to go see a social worker about your child. It's not like, you know, an MC, MCFD file is open on your child, so they get support within the centers. And most of them don't need it, but they are there in, in um, programs where they do. Does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Okay, everybody, well, this, uh, thank you very much, Jane. And um, time for a bit of a break till quarter to 11. There's some um, food and drink in the back there. Please help yourself. and. Uh, and let's reconvene in, in about 13 minutes. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Was that okay?
Thank you. Uh, hello. Okay, if everybody could, uh, I'm glad there's lots of talk about childcare going on here. Fantastic. Come on, uh, come on down and, uh, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Great. Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention, uh, uh, re with regards to the slides for uh, for the presentations today, and also in terms of just being up and uh, aware of all the things that we're doing at Help. If you uh, are a uh, already signed up for the Help newsletter, then there'll be a place you'll see there that uh, where you can make sure that you can have access to the slides. I think they'll also be on the website otherwise. Um, but um, sign up and find out what's happening through our through our our, our Help news newsletter. So, um, for our second uh, presenter today, uh, we have Linnell Anderson, um, who I might have mentioned before, has a, a long history with HELP. In fact, she's one of the co-authors of the 15 by 15 report, and it's worked a lot in family policy in general, and uh, uh, we'll be talking today uh, about uh, our new commitment to system change here in British Columbia. So she has uh, over 35 years of experience as a professional accountant in the private, public, voluntary, and academic sectors. She really um, specializes in uh, analyzing and utilizing financial information for uh, public accountability and to engage communities and advocate for uh, evidence-informed change. Um, so she likes to focus her activities on public policies that advance the rights of children, women, and families, especially with respect to childcare services. Uh, she has provided research and strategic leadership to the 10-a-day childcare campaign of the Advocacy Association, as well as in her, her uh, role at HELPS as a senior researcher for eight years, and um, which led actually to the establishment, in a, in a way, of Generation Squeeze, and uh, she still continues to work with us as an advisor on, on our family policy side. So without further ado, um, Again, uh, uh, hopefully there'll be, there'll be some questions uh, uh, available for half an hour after Linnell's talk. But without former ado, let's give her a, a welcome. To talk about this. Thank you so much, uh, Barry, and uh, and Help for inviting me here today. It's just a, a real thrill to be here, have a chance to share. Um, information with you and to build on the incredible presentation that Jane gave us. She really, I think, clearly and inspiringly uh, set the stage for us for what we can and do want to work towards in BC. And, um, and I think that the story I want to share with you, or uh, it's a story that I want to share with you, is about the work that we've been doing to try to make that come about. Um, and then the work that, of course, still significant work that still uh, lays before us. So I mentioned story. I'm, um, I'm going to um, uh, share a, a story that, that suggests how we've been moving the dial in BC uh, and how we need to conti continue moving that dial. I want to start by acknowledging that the dial moving that's happened, the, the success we've had to date, um, has come about because of so many groups and so many people involved in uh, uh, researching and advocating for childcare. As Jane mentioned, many, many groups. Uh, I won't be able to tell all of their stories or all even all of the stories that of, of the groups that I've been most directly involved in. Um, but I will share, in summary form, uh, highlights from the, primarily my work with the Coalition of Childcare Advocates of BC, uh, which is a feminist organization that uses research and advocacy to advance quality child care, um, and we've worked in partnership with the Early Childhood Educators of BC. So that'll be the, the primary lens through which I'll share um, the, the analysis, the strategies, and we think the successes that we've achieved to date. And then I'll move on to uh, an, an analysis of those successes using uh, the points that Jane brought up and 
bringing that into the lens, and then our recommendations for, for the immediate future. Um, so, I, as I say, I want to acknowledge that I, I can't in 45 minutes, first of all, not all of the stories are mine to tell, and I can't tell them all in 45 minutes. It's been a huge collective effort. I want, because I'm not going to focus on this at all, I do want to, for example, start by acknowledging that our um, colleagues in Indigenous communities have done amazing work. Um, BC Aboriginal Child Care Society to advance the Indigenous early learning and child care framework that is bringing major change to on reserve child care here in BC right now. And uh, our, our colleagues of the Aboriginal Head Start who are expanding both Aboriginal and child care related uh, Head Start programs across the province. So there are a lot of stories and a lot of collective efforts to, to share and to talk about. And I'm really pleased to have a little slice of time to share my reflections. As I mentioned, I'm going to um, start by talking about the, the work that we've been doing and why we've been doing it and why, which elements we think have been particularly successful in bringing us to where we are today. In that part, I'm going to focus on sort of the last 10 years because I'm going to share my aha moment. Nothing to do with dentures, but, um, <laughs> but it did, I think, it did, um, we, had, we had a few ahas that moved us into a new trajectory um, around 2006 that really started to create some difference in our world, our child care advocacy world. Um, so I'm going to focus on that for a, a significant portion of, the, of my talk this morning because it really sets the stage for how we measure success and the recommendations that go from there. But to, um, to even back that up, uh, I thought that I would start and go back in time a little bit um, and share with you uh, the story of how I became involved in childcare research and advocacy so that you had a sense of who's here and where they come from and the lens that I bring to my work as a result. So um, we're just going to, sorry, move on. So the, the child care world of research and advocacy has been going on for several decades, uh, longer than I've been involved in it. Some would, some, it's hard to point the exact time it started. Some would point back to the wartime child care, um, but certainly back as far as the 70s. I'm not going to go back that far. Uh, but I will go back to just over 30 years ago um, when those two young people, mine on the left, were much younger and they were cared for at SFU Child Care Society uh, up on the hill um, by those two uh, East early child educators um, as well as another early child educator who's with us here today, my good friend Pam. Um, yeah, and I, um, we were lucky uh, we knew it then, but we didn't realize how lucky we were. We were lucky to be able to be, find a space uh, that we could afford um, and that we received quality childcare um, at SFU uh, in those early years. So we, we were very lucky and that is a, a key to one of, the, one of the things I wanted to share and talk to you about why I got involved here because finding that, finding that quality childcare should not be a matter of luck. It should be a matter of a right. Um, but that's, that's where we were. And um, the SFU uh, was, it was and still is uh, a parent-run child care society. As Jane said, in BC, many, many programs are run by parents. And um, when they found out that I was an accountant, you can guess which position they invited me to take on the board. That's right. And I was, um, I was really honored. Um, and, and pleased to be asked to be the treasurer. I took on that role for many years. And um, the reason I was so pleased to take it on, even though I was working full time and soon had two young children, is because the educators in that program um, were providing such an incredible support to our family. They were absolutely supporting our children's early learning childcare. They were also supporting my parenting. Uh, and so I, I really want to, you know, I think there's a conversation to be had about parenting supports because in quality childcare, that happens too. That's how I learned about healthy snacks and redirecting behavior and how to help a child calm down when they were a little bit over the top, right? So there was both parenting and early learning that happened there and also that it supported me to work uh, and do a career that I loved. At least I loved it until I found out about childcare and then I loved that more. Um, 
so I was pleased to give back, and of course, one of the first things that I had to do in working with the ED, one thing about SFU and a parent board is that SFU had an inf has an infrastructure with an ED and so on, so the parents aren't doing like basic payroll and things like that, so it's a bit different than some small nonprofits. At any rate, my first um, assignment, of course, was to work on the budget. And as we opened up the books and looked at those and prepared the budget, I was shocked to find that although we thought we were paying high parent fees, and let me be clear, the parent fees were nothing compared to what they are today, even with the time value of money, but we thought they were high parent fees, uh, but they weren't translating into uh, reasonable wages for the skilled early child educators, and I was blown away by how low the wages were for the staff that were caring for our children. And so at the board, we developed a plan working with ED to seek approval from the parents for a fee increase with the commitment that that fee increase would be passed on to staff in a wage increase. And I walked around to all of the 13 programs, I think there were at that time, and we held parent meetings and people voted. And almost unanimously, they voted for a fee increase for that very reason, because they valued, they knew how excellent the educators were and how important a wage increase was. And so it went through. Within a few months, our ED, our executive director, was reporting back to the board that we were losing parents. Enrollment was dropping. And so I asked, why is enrollment dropping? And she said, well, because they can't afford the fees. And if they can't afford the fees, they can't stay here. So I made an appointment to meet with her. And I sat down and I said, where are the families going who can't afford to be here? And she said, wherever they can. And I said, tell me more. And the tell me more was the beginning of my listening and learning and then acting on that in childcare. That's why I became involved in researching solutions to this issue. And that's why I became involved in the advocacy community. I actually moved off the mountain um, and was femtered actually by the wonderful Marianne Bird to join West Coast Child Care Resource Center and I worked across the province and in a number of uh, consulting capacities to try to help individual child care programs strengthen their budgets and be able to pay staff more and not charge parents too much fees. But the reality was that without some kind of outside funding, and as Jane would share with, shared with us, everywhere that outside funding is public funding, uh, without that we would be forever conf confined to either a trade-off between educator wages and parent fees. So I became very involved in the advocacy world as well as the research world. I'm going to fast forward now. Um, and as part of our advocacy agenda throughout those years, you know, we put forward recommendations to government, we put forward uh, policy ideas, we shared research results with both levels of government, provincially and federally. Uh, and we did have some, uh, what I would say, small wins or some potential wins or some, some good short-term wins uh, in the next decades. So some of you might remember back to the late 90s in BC where we had low fee school age childcare for a while, um, but it didn't last after the government changed. And then you might remember more recently in the early 2000s, the federal government became invo involved, Paul Martin, under Paul Martin, and hockey legend, help me, Ken Dryden, thank you, um, did the uh, federal provincial, first federal provincial agreements with, uh, with childcare funding. And these were really positive signs and we were optimistic about them, but again, they didn't last, and Jane pointed to this as well, they didn't last when the government changed. And so the, often what we were seeing, a pattern here, was that there was some commitment to childcare coming in various governments, but it happened so late in their mandate that there hadn't been real progress on the ground that you could point to and build from and, and stay with. And so by around 2006 or so, now I'm going to move into the real current time. By around 2006, um, that's when I had my aha moment, and several of us had an aha in the coalition and with ECBC had an aha moment. Um, and it's because we had some advice that came from different quarters, but it was fairly similar. And the advice was, 
you're uh, reacting to and putting out ideas and suggestions to government. Um, but, you're, you, what, what, but you have all the information, you know exactly what needs to happen, or pretty much. What, you, what would be better is to actually take all those pieces of advice that you're, being sh that you're sharing and lay out a detailed plan for government. Lay out a detailed plan and share it with them. And then on day one, when they are elected, they have a roadmap to follow right away and begin to have progress achieved right away so that when their four years is up, there is progress, so much progress on the ground that people want to continue building this, this program. And the, the person that said that to us, uh, that, that really stuck it, stuck it for me, she said, you have to stop reacting and start being proactive. And she was an activist from Quebec and had been very involved in the Quebec movement there to, uh, to advance childcare in Quebec. And she said, the day that the Quebec government that started childcare in Quebec, the day that they you know, opened, there was the plan right on the desk to work with. So that inspired a really fundamental change for us. And I think the first step of what I'd want to suggest to you is um, the strategy that we think one of the first steps of the four steps that we identify as the strategies that we think supported us collectively, all of us that worked on this, to um, achieve success in bringing about government's commitment to universal child care. So what we did is in step number one, I'm going to go into detail on these, but here are the four strategies to lay them out for you. In step one, this was the fundamental change. Take the different policy recommendations and develop them into a detailed plan. We, we, did, we had a vision, we had a picture of the vision that we wanted to achieve, we had a detailed plan. It was, the, it was and still is the roadmap that has been prevented, presented to government uh, for them to implement. Of course, when you're proposing and laying out the details of a new public system, like education or any other public system, then right off the bat, and we already knew this was happening, um, this was happening beforehand with our recommendations, um, right away people are going to ask, well, how much is this going to cost and how are we going to pay for it? And so we had already been doing some work, and this is an area that, that I was particularly involved in. We'd been building up some, doing some work to cost out our recommendations. And I'll share with you the costing model that I worked with in community and at HELP over many years and was updated to um, not only say, here's our plan, and yes, here's how much it's going to cost, but there are benefits, not but, and there are significant benefits that go along with those costs. So the second key strategy and success factor for us, I think, was that we not only knew the costs, but we knew the benefits that would come from investing in this system. And thirdly, we didn't know this at the time. This is a strategy about learning as we go. And um, this I want to point particularly here. I'll talk about it elsewhere as well. But I want to point particularly here to the work that my colleague Paul Kershaw um, led at HELP and at Gen Squeeze as well. Um, because this is where we really came up with um, a, a, a meaningful brand. And Gen Squeeze's work was um, really instrumental in the coming up for, uh, with a frame, uh, a communications frame that was really important in turning a detailed plan into something that was really understandable and, and could be used publicly. And that brings us to the fourth element of success, which is mobilizing. We always knew that what we had to do in order to create political support for change, we had to create public support for change. It's strong public support that gives politicians the space to make change. And so the fourth, the fourth uh, element of success um, was mobilizing the broad-based support for the 10-day plan across the province. All right, so let me just um, say a bit more about each one of these individually. So the 10-day plan um, has some copies here. You're welcome, to, you're welcome to help yourself to them. They're also online at 10aday.ca. Um, the 10-day plan uh, was Originally, we had the, the elements of it way back in 2006, even 2007. But in the next couple of years, we uh, 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 commissioned some research, um, and we had some consultations with allies and supporters. And we took our recommendations and developed them into a draft plan, 
We partnered with the early childhood educators of BC who also wanted to advance this. And we, in 2010, we began to consult province-wide uh, on the parameters of the $10 a day plan. And we got feedback, we updated it. In fact, over the last 10 years, the plan has been updated eight times. This is the eighth edition you'll see right now, always integrating new research, new knowledge, new learnings, and new support for the plan. There's three key elements that I want to mention in the plan. First of all, we've worked over time with our Indigenous colleagues to ensure that we're integrating Indigenous rights and an Indigenous authority, authority into the plan. Secondly, um, we wanted to build from what exists. This is a really fundamental commitment in the plan. And it's a reality. As, as uh, Jane mentioned when she talked about Norway, it's sort of 50% uh, publicly delivered and 50% privately delivered. So we already have significant, mostly in BC right now, we have uh, private, privately delivered childcare, either not-for-profit or for-profit childcare. And what we wanted to do is give all of those um, childcare programs the opportunity to be part of the new universal system that we're proposing. Um, and the, the reason for that, part of the reason for that, there's some practical reasons for that. Those spaces exist, families use them. There are childcare people have invested in them and, and tried to make them as best as, as good as they can without the kind of resources to do that uh, appropriately. Um, so th those spaces exist. Um, but also we were seeing uh, action in the Ministry of Education around uh, early education in ways that weren't including, recognizing, respecting, and involving the childcare sector. Now, action in the Ministry of Education is positive uh, in many ways. What we see when education expands and brings on programs like Strong Start or moves from part-day kindergarten to full-day kindergarten, they have the three key elements that Jane shared with us are elements to effective systems. They, are, they have capped parent fees, capped at zero. They have uh, quality staff with good, good credentials that they pay well. Um, and that they're universal in their approach, and they're publicly delivered. So those are three really important uh, characteristics that we want to work towards. But at the same time, what they, um, what they weren't doing was involving and including the child care community. So we're calling, we're calling in the plan to uh, invite all existing child care providers to be part of the new system, um, and provided that they are committed um, with accountability to use new public funding to uh, cap parent fees, reducing cap parent fees to a maximum $10 a day, raise educator wages, and meet some other uh, accountability requirements like follow the early learning framework uh, that's been introduced, those kinds of things. Um, and so we, uh, we also called for e expansion, of, uh, obviously, of coverage or spaces um, to meet uh, diverse family needs. But we called for expansion, growth, in this new system to be public delivery. And that way we would have a substantial public delivery as the research recommends and include the private sector that exists right now. So those were the, those were the elements of the 10 a day plan that we put forward. Um, at the same time, sorry, you went over here. At the same time, as I mentioned to you before, we, we focused on the costing and the benefits. That's, a, that's the second part I want to go to now. And to explain um, the costing and benefits, I want to use this picture of a model of a public system, not just to explain the costing and benefits, but also to explain our rationale and how we um, think about and share the information. So this chart, this box, um, is a visual that is intended to represent a, a way of looking at public systems. Okay, and this, in this particular, this particular picture, we're going to move to childcare in a minute. But in this picture, uh, I'm thinking, asking you to think of a public system that we know in Canada today. It could be education here in BC. It could be health care, um, any kind of public system. And in a fully 100% funded, high quality, meets all needs for the population that's trying to serve, in a perfect public system, we would be up we would have the, this whole box would be filled with green and we'd be filled right up to the top right hand corner, right? That would be a perfect public system. And yet we know public systems in B 
BC and Canada today um, are both what I would call what I call praised and pressured. So when we look at international rankings, B, uh, education in Canada, including in BC, is ranked quite highly. Right? When we look at how uh, we support elderly, elderly populations, we're ranked quite highly, like in the top five or six, because we have universal health care and universal pensions. Right? So we're praised on the one hand for the strength of our systems, but we know from our work in communities that those same systems are also under pressure. And the, or, the uh, arrows there show some of the pressure points. We don't necessarily have all the resources we need to support all the children in education to the extent that they need to be supported. Um, and while education is technically free, we don't have any parent fees, we know that families are concerned about levels of fundraising that are required and the pressures around that that are put on them. So those are examples of these pressure points. And as Jane said to us, no public system is perfect, but many of them have strengths that we can build from. So I want to share this with you saying, we are recommending a move to a public system knowing that it's not perfect, but it certainly is a lot stronger, a lot stronger than where we are with childcare right now. So this is that same visual with a picture of where we are in childcare. This is the, the visual that I use to describe the costing model, so you'll be very happy that you're not seeing a bunch of Excel spreadsheets right now. Um, but this is, this is the way that we visualize it and work with community to explain and talk about it and learn from it. So right now, um, if you look at where the, the blue line ends here, uh, some, around 20% of kids under 12, maybe close to 24% of those under 5, have access to a child care space in BC right now. And so the gap between that 20% and a fully universal system we call across the top the expansion gap. That's how much the system needs to grow. Of, this, of the spaces that do exist right now, internationally, on average, parents pay somewhat less than 20% of the total costs of quality child care. But we know parents are paying way more than that in BC right now. And so the gap between what parents are paying right now, the top of the blue bar, and what's an affordable level, internationally at least, a standard, we call the affordability gap, okay? And then, as my story about SFU, and many of you can share similar stories from your experience, will, will, uh, will highlight, when we take the parent fees, which are unaffordable, and we add the small amount of public funding that did exist, um, does exist, it's higher now, but I'm, this is, I should be clear, this is pre-2018, okay? Pre-child care expansion. When we add um, the tiny amount of public funding that did exist to the high parent fees, it still wasn't enough, to, it isn't enough to provide the kind of a fair remuneration that early child educators deserve. So the gap between the funding that does exist and the, where, we, where we need to be for high quality is obviously called the quality gap. So this is the picture of where we were and where we're trying to move away from. And it is the basis of the costing models that have been, that have been working with the community on since the early 2000s, first starting in Vancouver locally. And then in 2007, we did our first provincial um, uh, costing based on this model. And it's been updated regularly ever since. In fact, for three BC-based uh, cost-benefit analyses, and the first one is a really landmark report that Barry referred to uh, took place here at Help UBC Help. Um, Paul Kershaw is a lead author. I was pleased to work on that with him and Clyde Hertzman. And in this report, we looked at um, the full family policy uh, components that would support healthy child development, so including childcare, but not limited to childcare, also looking at parental leave, um, uh, income supports, and so on. The 15 by 15 title came from a government commitment to reduce early vulnerability to 15% by 2015, a uh, commitment that's now gone by the board, um, but it made for a good report title. Um, at any rate, that, that report, as I say, was really fundamental in that it showed that while there would be a significant investment to address early vulnerability, there would also be significant returns. Two key learnings from that report were, first of all, 
that while those returns are very significant, when we look only at the benefits for, from um, supporting children's healthy development, those are not realized till down the road when children are adults. And uh, that's when we see higher graduation rates, higher employment rates, higher income, and so on. So it's way down the road. And again, going back to Jane's point about the four-year mandate that governments tend to have, um, getting support for something that has benefits 20 years from now is really hard to do. Now, in that report, we did try to focus as well. We tried to bring in some of the more current um, uh, uh, realities, but the but still, or the current benefits, but it was still primarily looking down the road. And so coming out of that uh, work, um, Paul and I worked with, for example, some business leaders to look at what is the cost of not addressing this? What's the cost of the business community? And so we did some more current costs and benefit analysis um, to really bring, look at more near-term benefits um, for this work. And the, the, gen, the 15 by 15 report received a lot of public interest, government interest, media interest, and it really, I think, launched uh, the work that Paul has led since then uh, in Gen Squeeze, and, um, and really important work there that I'll come back to in, in a couple of minutes with an example. But so after the, that um, report came out in 2009, we have updated the cost-benefit model twice. Um, in 2015 and then again in 2017. We looked at the benefits this time um, uh, uh, only of the child care component. Um, in one report, we looked at the, helpfully, the Quebec uh, system was coming out with, with some really strong evidence about how the near-term benefits were fully realized because the system pays for itself because of the increase in women's workforce participation. And then in 2017, Different economists, private sector economists with a different methodology, same costing model updated yet again, and it showed the same thing, that the system more than pays for itself. So we went into the 2017 election acknowledging that the system we were promoting was going to cost about $1.5 billion uh, fully implemented uh, and being very transparent about that and also sharing the strong benefits that would come from that investment as well. Thirdly, I want to talk about um, the leading with a meaningful brand and frame. So we knew, um, even before we came out with the 10-a-day the plan, the plan, we knew it was recommended to us that we needed to ground our work in evidence, but don't lead with it. We, needed, we, didn't need, we couldn't overwhelm the public with the policy details. Uh, we needed to find a, a simple and straightforward way to share what we were talking about. Um, and, and at that point, we hadn't achieved that because the plan, just so you know, the real, the full name of the plan is called uh, a community plan for a public system of integrated early care and learning. You couldn't even tweet that back then. Um, so, we, so we hadn't done that, but at Gen Squeeze, um, that did happen. So um, Paul was working on a, on a very significant communications research and framing project. And out of that, uh, we were working with a communications person who asked us, uh, what do you mean by affordable childcare? And I said, well, on average, parents pay no more than 20% of the total operating costs of a quality space. And he just said, forget that. You're not, you can't take that out to the public. You have to have something really concrete. And so we went back and we took the costing model and said, um, and Paul suggested $10 a day is something to aim for. It's a little bit higher than they're paying in Quebec at that time, so we're having more contribution to quality and so on. Um, but let, So let's model it at $10 a day. And sure enough, we could show that we could reduce the fees to $10 a day, uh, make them no fees at all for families earning less than 40000 which was about the poverty rate at that point, and still stay within the total parent fee component that we'd included incorporated into the budget. And so um, ten, the 20% the of operating costs became $10 a day. And um, helpfully, you know, uh, the coalition and ECBC, our partnership, and Gen Squeeze help had all used the costing model, and so we were supported by Gen Squeeze to also use the 10 a day uh, brand. And so the community plan for a public system of integrated early care and learning became the 10 a day plan. 
And from that point, uh, both organizations, Gen Squeeze, in its broader mandate to look at uh, all, all effects on younger generations, and the coalition and ECBC with their specific mandate on, on childcare, we were able to move forward from there and mobilize, start really rocking and rolling. And now I'll pick up the pace here too because this is when things started to happen. Uh, we launched a 10 a day campaign um, and we began mobilizing across the province. Um, we engaged families, communities, local governments and school districts signed on to the plan. We encouraged all political parties because we had messages coming out from individual supporters to parties to uh, support the plan. We um, expanded our social media outreach. We organized fun activities. So we had stroller brigades with marching bands and we had uh, um, uh, parades and so on. And of course, made the news consistently. And the result of that is that even today, because we still keep growing support for the plan because it needs to, we've only started, it needs, there's a long ways to go. Uh, we have 63 local governments, more than half of the province's school districts signed on to the plan, a range of organizations including the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, Credit Unions, United Way, the Union of BC Municipalities. We have academics to help as a support of the plan, a community and labor and business and women's organizations, 20,000 individuals in total. Um, we estimate that the support represents well over 2 million uh, uh, British Columbians and is growing from there. And so we came to the 2017 election um, with, uh, by the time the dust was settled, and it took a while for the dust to settle, as we all remember, but by the time the dust was settled, we had um, all the major BC political parties making significant commitments to childcare, and we had um, the $50 million a year, roughly, uh, investment commitment from the federal government. And so, <clears throat> in 2018, we celebrated a historical childcare budget in BC, $1 billion in new funding over three years with a commitment that these are the first steps towards universal childcare within about 10 years. Okay, and um, prior to, just as the dust was settling on the election, we updated our plan to provide very specific first step recommendations to government, um, several of which uh, were taken. We made recommendations in three areas, and you'll recognize these three areas, lower parent fees, invest in the workforce, and expand availability, um, expand this number of spaces. In terms of lowering parent fees, we recommended a fee reduction initiative, which uh, was implemented right away, so in all licensed childcare programs, full day programs under six. We didn't specifically recommend 10 a day prototypes at that time, but it turns out that this was a, a very positive thing to do. Um, so there's like uh, 50, over 50 prototype sites across the province uh, where parents are experiencing $10 a day uh, childcare at maximum, uh, some less. And um, as I say, it wasn't a specific recommendation, but it does make really visual um, for people the, that, that the goal is $10 a day and it creates the pressure around that, which is a positive thing. You'll see the X here. The X means that this is not evidence-based policy and we're not, uh, we didn't, didn't recommend it and we don't recommend it. And that is expanding access to parent fee subsidies. There's several reasons for that. Barry, you and I looked at fee subsidies years ago and we showed that when parent fees, su when subsidies go up, parent fees go up and typically we're not any better off. Um, they're also available in the unlicensed sector, which is something that is uh, challenging as well. So we don't recommend expanded subsidies, we recommend reducing parent fees instead. In terms of developing the workforce, the first uh, publicly funded wage increases for early childhood educators in what we say is a generation in almost 20 years. A dollar an hour has happened already, another dollar an hour happening April 1st, and expanded bursaries and um, post-secondary education spaces for early childhood educators. Um, in terms of availability of spaces, the actual expansion, we're pleased to see that there's a prioritization on expanding with public spaces. Uh, so we should be expanding in, in where other community services are, um, schools, etc. Uh, there's an expansion, expanded supports for inclusion. As I mentioned, Aboriginal Head Start is expanding. What we're very concerned about is, um, is that, in, that there are, there are fund, capital funds being provided to for-profit operators. So these are public funds 
to purchase privately owned assets. This was a policy of the previous government, which we also were very concerned about and expressed that a concern. It's carried on. It's not a priority. It's not necessarily the top priority of current government, but it is still happening, and we're very concerned about that uh, for, for a range of reasons. It, it, it also means that we are continuing to expand the for-profit sector, and so we're undermining that uh, the goal of having substantial public delivery when we're growing the for-profit sector, the private for-profit sector. So this is problematic, and so you won't be surprised to see that, that affects the recommendations I'll be coming to in one minute. Despite the problematic pieces that I've described to you, we need to be aware that these first steps um, are making a real and concrete difference in BC. And so I'll show you, um, I'll, I'll, I'll do a picture of that by going back to the childcare costing model, right? So what we've seen, if we could call this phase one, 2018 to 20, the first three years of the plan, what we're seeing is that uh, wages, as I mentioned, are going up by $2 an hour. Fees are down. Over 50,000 families are paying less than they were two years ago, and some are paying uh, as low as, t as t $10 a day, as I mentioned. And there's been um, a commitment already of funding of over 10,000 spaces. So we've had progress, and we, have to, we want to really honour and acknowledge that, and we have to keep up the positive pressure to keep going because we have about another seven years to build out a universal system, which clearly has to have increased compensation, lower parent fees going down to $10 a day, and enough spaces for all who want or need them. And so, um, so on, on, that, on the spirit of acknowledging the progress and positive pressure to keep going, I want to share some polling results um, from, from May, of this, May of last year. When, uh, when uh, the pollster spoke to families, or uh, checked with families, two out of three BC families say that the government's investments are having a positive impact on their childcare situation. So there's the positive. At the same time, 70% say that they still had, that a parent had to wait, remain away from work longer than, they'd, longer than their parental leave because they couldn't find a space. So progress, much more to do. When we were polling, the polling results from family, from British Columbians more broadly, not just families, but all British Columbians, 90% agree that public investments in a quality, affordable childcare system are important. Our pollster said you can't get 90% of British Columbians to agree on anything, uh, but apparently they agree on this. So this is very strong support for government to keep going in this direction, and in fact, 76% agree that the government should move even more quickly on childcare. So. There is some broad-based public support that we can and should use to maintain the positive pressure on government to continue, uh, continue the good thing it's doing and stop the not-so-good things that it's doing. And here, to close up our, our recommendations, then continuing to build on the $10 a day plan. First of all, on the operational side, we're calling for an increase in operating funding by $200 million per year. Um, and that this, the $200 million per year is pretty simple math. It's like from where we were and to add $1.5 billion uh, within 10 years and plus more for school age, we need to basically increase by about $200 million per year. And we need to, we want, we're recommending using that to expand the 10-a-day prototypes, make them available to more families and continue to lower parent fees to create a provincial wage grid. So we need to move from across the board at one dollar an hour kinds of approaches, which were an important first step to an actual wage grid that ensures that those with higher qualifications um, are earning a, a higher salary than those with lower qualifications, as Jane talked about. And we, and we want to make sure that the access to ECE education is very accessible. Uh, the second recommendation is to um, move childcare to the Ministry of Education for all of the reasons that you could well imagine. It, it, it has an existing infrastructure. It knows how to deliver a universal system. Um, we are calling for childcare and education to be strong and equal partners in developing this, uh, this system, the $10 a day system. Um, well, we can talk more about that in the questions if we want to, because I know I'm almost at the end here. Um, but we're calling for a move to the Ministry of Education with a capital budget to create more publicly owned spaces. And let me just pause, have I got five? 
Four. Okay, that's, I can do this in four. Um, let me just pause here to say, to give you an example of, of what we mean when we're talking about why it's so important to move to the Ministry of Education and how that compares to what's happening in childcare right now. Um, can you imagine if we asked groups of parents and teachers, elementary school parents and teachers, to come together to fill out a funding application for a school, to hire an architect, then to hire the construction crew, oversee the construction, hire the teachers, and implement the program. That's, you know, and people, when we ask that question, they say, well, that's ridiculous. Um, and, but the thing, that's what we're doing in childcare still, okay? We are still doing one-off individual applications, even for the public spaces. We don't have yet um, we're having s transformation, but we don't have a transformational approach and we don't have a system systematic approach yet. And that's one of the many uh, reasons why we think it's so important to move into the Ministry of Education where they're already actually building childcare into expanded schools, especially here in Vancouver and elsewhere as well. They have an infrastructure to deliver. In 2010, when the Premier of the time, I think it was 2010, said, we are going to move from part-day kindergarten to full-day kindergarten. In two years, 40,000 kindergartners have full school-day kindergarten because education has an infrastructure to deliver and they have a universal approach, all the benefits of a public system that I introduced to start with. So that's one of the many reasons why we're making that recommendation. Um, at, the at the same time, when people say, but it takes longer to build schools and so on, we can maybe move more quickly with the commercial sect, corporate childcare sector, we say there are solutions to that. And one of the solutions is to look at, um, uh, expedite a bulk purchase of modular buildings. And there's a beautiful example, a small picture of it right here, uh, here on UBC campus with the new modulars that are, that are here. And there's, there's a picture of the inside of them. And as I move to my final slide, um, here's a picture of the outside of the new UBC modulars that could be models for what we could do province-wide. So I want to end by saying we've talked about all of the reasons why childcare is important for children and families and the benefits to the economy and so on. I want to end by also reminding us that um, done well, childcare is important for addressing four of the most urgent issues that we think about facing us as a country, as a, as a world today. Childcare child care affects all of them. Um, done well, child care advances reconciliation. It is consistent with truth, uh, the truth and reconciliation calls to action. Um, it contributes to G GDP, offsetting what my uh, colleague Armin Yanlitsian, the economist, calls sloth. So most economists are predicting that we will have slower economic growth in the future. It's, it's unavoidable for a range of reasons, and she calls that sloth. So, by, uh, by introducing universal childcare, we will actually offset the problems of sloth. Um, childcare supports a, a just climate transition. There's many reasons why that's the case. I'll highlight uh, two quickly. First of all, it's a local, it's localized. Um, but secondly, childcare is people powered, not, uh, not powered by non-renewable resources. And finally, if we do a fully universal system that truly meets the diverse needs of all families and welcomes and includes them, then we will reduce inequality. And so I hope that if you haven't signed already, um, that I could convince you now to pull out your cell phones and uh, Sharon, my good colleague Sharon, my coworker, my colleague on 10 day plan would never ever finish a presentation no matter where it was without uh, encouraging people to please show their support for us moving forward by texting sign to the number on the screen there. Thank you very much. Well, that was fantastic. Thanks so much, Linnell. Um, we have about 25 minutes left for uh, audience uh, to make a comment or to ask a question. And I, um, I'm going to invite uh, Jane to come and, and join uh, Linnell at the front here. But since uh, Jane had a bit of an opportunity at the end of her talk, does anyone have a specific question for Linnell that they'd like to ask or make a comment about? Yeah. 
Um, thank you so much. Um, I guess I've got two questions. Well, a, a, a concern and a question. My first concern is that I understand totally your rationale for wanting to move to the Ministry of Education. My concern is that it will then uh, uh, reproduce a focus on school readiness and that the care and the more social, emotional needs of children and families will eventually get diluted under that, that ministry. And then my other question is, um, how, what happens when we don't have this government? Sure, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll address both of those and I'll also welcome Jane to join in at any point with them too. So uh, let me do the second one first. Um, what happens when we don't have this government, I'm, you know, obviously I'm not completely sure and I can't predict that, but what I can say is that that's why we're so focused on achieving progress right now. Because the more families and educators and communities benefit <coughs> from real progress, the harder it is to roll back that progress. Um, you know, after in Quebec, after the introduction of childcare and it got rolling in Quebec, at that point, initially it was $5 a day, right? And they had a huge increase in spaces, not without issues that we are trying to address in our plan, which they acknowledge, but they had a huge increase in spaces. And then when a new government came in and they were said, well, we're spending a lot of money here, we'd like to cut back, 10,000 parents took to the streets to say, don't touch our childcare program. And the most that happened is government increased the daily rate from $5 to $7 at that point. Now there's been other pressures and issues that arisen in Quebec. So in the end, the strength of what we build is only as good as the political will that we can maintain to keep building it. And that's why our work has to continue. That's why we called the title Moving the Dial, not that it's moved. It's, it, we have to keep moving the dial and working for it. Um, but, but the goal is to have so much um, progress in place and, and, predict, and foreseeable, right, that more, even more people can benefit if we keep going, that, that it, will, um, it will be sustained throughout whoever is next in power. We'll also, the reality is too that it's such a, it's such a relevant issue for families that, um, as I mentioned to you, in 2017, in the 2017 election, all of the major parties had political commitments to childcare. They just weren't all as strong um, as they could be. So it is, a, it is a live issue for sure for all parties. Now go back to your question about moving into the Ministry of Education. Um, the, the question about will there be, by moving there, you could see many advantages, but you're concerned about pressure on school readiness as opposed to real early care and learning. Um, and that's, a, that's a, a question we hear, we understand. Um, there's been, I think, people, many, many uh, provinces have moved beyond the school readiness uh, sole focus, or at least understanding it in a very narrow way, and I think there's a much broader understanding of what that means and less likely, less likely to use that actual term. Um, but also there's some real evidence of the desire to step away from that by the early learning framework, for example, which is a, which is a really good, um, more holistic approach to, to childhood. Nonetheless, we have said, and the OECD has said, that the mo within education there needs to be a strong and equal partnership with early childhood educators and teachers with the two systems to ensure that we maintain the hold on early care and learning. And we do recommend separate legislation for that as well within the Ministry of Ed. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, just a couple of things, that countries that have m moved to education have found generally that instead of the schoolification or brainification of children uh, being pressured down, that the reverse has happened. That in fact, the early childhood approach uh, used in childcare has, has, has filtered upward. And to say that it is really important, I mean, one of the reasons I like using the term early childhood education and care and including kindergarten, which in most provinces, but not all, it's not compulsory, but everybody goes because it's there and they can afford it, is the integration of, of the two if childcare <coughs> comes to education. So eight jurisdictions now have moved um, childcare mm -hmm. under ministries of education, but we haven't necessarily seen that integration, that it's still kind of the poor cousin. So it's really important to think, uh, you know, to think more holistically. But I think the fears of the sort of more traditional views of 
uh, you know, early childhood education is, has not uh, sort of seen, hasn't come to pass when, when countries have done that. Thank you. Um, any hands to, okay. Hi, thank you both very much. Um, I always find myself in an interesting position because my husband is an early childhood educator here at UBC, um, and because of that we actually have been able to have access to quality childcare from a very early time point, um, and then also are now at one of the $200 a day, $200 prototype centers, so it's sort of this very interesting place of privilege. Um, my research work now is in, child, is in a childcare setting. And something we hear a lot from educators is, you know, it's so hard to take on more things right now because with all of the government initiatives, as you mentioned, there's all of this new paperwork that comes along with it. Being a part of the fee reductions programs, the wage increase programs all require paperwork for them right now. So my question is, how do we, when we move into a publicly funded space, do we also move out of the minimum standard regulation licensing standard we have right now and into a quality childcare, like ensuring that high quality childcare is being met without the requirements of constant paperwork in addition to providing high quality childcare. Uh, sure, I'll start. Well, so first of all, I, I just want to say because your question ties to what I was saying before about that we had not, not yet actually had a systemic transformation. So the, the changes that are happening right now, because they're in a market-based system, not a public system yet, are happening very one-off. There's one-off applications for capital grants. There's one-off applications for your wage supplement. There's one-off applications for your fee reduction, right? That's not a system. That kind of thing does not happen in education. I think the question we could ask ourselves always when we're facing these questions is, how do, what would it look like in education? And that's not what it would look like because that's not how our system approaches it. But it, until we have a professional work, fully professional workforce, you know, right now we're relying on apparently over 6,000 assistants in programs with 60 hours of training. Um, so we have a ways to go to develop a professional workforce and to move away from this sort of one-off application-based approach into an actual system. I think you've covered most of what I would say, but just to add one thing, that schools aren't licensed the way childcare centers are licensed. And, well, just using the example of Norway, that um, they have very strong regulation, but there's also a huge amount of flexibility for the, uh, you know, for the operators, the pedagogical leaders and head teachers in centers. So that they're not there sort of measuring the space between cribs and sort of all those things that, that happen sort of under our, under our regulation. There are lots of guidelines, but the thing about the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and those kinds of really intrinsic values are, are kinds of the things that are regulated. They regulate the uh, qualifications of staff and the child to staff ratios, but not group size, for example. So there's all kinds of flexibility in that. And when you have a well-educated staff, you don't have to be so prescriptive and directed, directed. less paperwork for sure. Uh -huh. Next Paul. Thank you, Linnell and Jane, so much for the presentations. Um, I had a question for Jane. Um, I noticed in your presentation when you were describing what you learned in Norway, the, the terminology was not a ministry of education, because just connecting with what you said, but the union of directorates. No, the... Um, or, sorry, the yeah, so I, just, I was just wondering if, if there is a difference because when I, when I think about, this is the question of uh, early childhood education, you know, being um, hosted or, you know, uh, within the Ministry of Education has been a conversation for many decades and the systems are so different and the rigidity of the, of the school system with the Ministry of Education and all the unions and all of that is another level. So I thought, is what is happening in Norway also related that there is like a different system of governance well, on the top? Well, there is a national...
Department of Education and Research, and they are responsible for the kindergarten child care, you know, license out of the act, the regulations, the policy. And then underneath the Ministry of Education is this, they're called an executive agency of government, this education directorate, whose job it is to ensure that those policies and regulations are put in place on the ground. So they're an arm, you know, they're, they're kind of like a crown corporation, I guess, in, in okay. the Canadian context. So they're not officially government, but they're doing government's work in the, in the community. And so, um, yeah, it's, it is quite a different set, a, a, a different way of operating. The other thing is they have such knowledgeable content experts in the bureaucracy. We tend here not to follow that approach that people are generic policy makers and they can move, they, they can be in forests one year and then, you know, childcare the next. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but, and there, there are some content experts, but it's really just by chance more than by design. And so if you don't have that expertise inside government, and that's a huge difference there, that they, they really know what they're doing. And the unions as well, there are, uh, the union that represents kindergarten teachers, the people that I met with there were formerly kindergarten teachers themselves. And so they, you know, they really understand what those working conditions are, how they play out sort of on the ground. Thank you, we, we have a lot of work to do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, um, thank you so much for sharing all your research and for all the work that you've been doing. Um, I just have like a simple question. Do you have any practical advice for future early childhood educators and what we can do to partner with policymakers that's, and to advocate for kids and families? Well, first of all, you could get involved in advocacy organizations. You could join the Coalition of Childcare Advocates of BC. You could join Childcare Now. Um, that way you'd, um, you know, have a, have a vehicle for your voice to be heard and to stay current on sort of what's, there you go. <laughs> Sharon will make sure you sign up right after this session. Um, and keep reading. We, you know, there are some fantastic websites. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the Child Care Resource and Research Unit, which is based in Toronto, has a weekly broadcast. They have tons of online resources. They have like little blurbs about what's going on in the world in childcare, you know, internationally, and they're an excellent resource. I'd also add a um, suggestion that you, if you're not already, that you join your professional association, the Early Child oh, Educators sorry, at BC. Oh, sorry, of course. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> about no, that's good. We're that. tag team in here. That's okay. You can promote the advocacy. I'll promote the professionalism. <laughs> <laughs> that's an inside joke. <laughs> Good morning. Let me begin by saying uh, what a delight it is to get to learn from two elite leaders in our field today. So thank you for making the time to come and share your expertise with us. My question is for Jane. Oh, I hope it's not too hard. No, no, this is a, this, I don't think so. So Jane, uh, it's actually a, quite a, a little minor detail question. Okay. Early, in your con, in, early in your presentation and when you were trying to describe the system, you were making a distinction between kindergarten and then childcare and early learning. And toward the bottom of your list of things that distinguish them, you describe kindergarten as not having a labor attachment association with it, whereas or that purpose, in purpose, purpose. A, labor, a labor attachment purpose with it, whereas childcare and early learning often does. And ever since I saw that, I've been kind of percolating about that. I'm like, was that historically accurate? Is it still accurate? And is it strategic to s describe it that way? And as Linnell mentioned earlier, I'm routinely thinking both about framing issues and just evidence evidence issues more generally. And so one of the reasons why it worries me about you know, framing that distinction a little bit is when you think about some of the benefit cost research that Linnell was highlighting, the way to make it pay, something pay for itself now is often by pointing to the labor force attachment uh, returns to government that come from systems. And so, you know, just as childcare has that, so does the education component. There's also the lived experience right now. I mean, we have the strikes happening among school teachers in Ontario. What did the government of Ontario do? They started giving some of the yeah. largest subsidies for childcare that we've ever, you know, that they ever make available. And so that gets at how school 
maybe back in the day didn't have that orientation, but you talk to any generation raising young kids right now, and they think about school facilitating their labor force attachment. And so I wonder about the pros and cons, and, and I don't have a take on it, but it certainly alerted me to the, the interesting way in which we might say school's only about kids. And the last reason I say is like I'm routinely trying to calculate how, you know, how does public spending divide by different age groups? And I could never figure out, like, how could I not give some of the investments in the school age system for education to parents in the same way that I would for childcare? Because if we didn't have school, you'd have just as many parents, in particular because of the gender situation, just as many women struggling with that work-life balance. And so, for all those reasons, I was wondering, what was the motivation for you to distinguish well, the two of those ways? Partly because I think the goal is to have an integrated system. And so there's not such a distinction between kindergarten. And I'm choosing kindergarten because it's the one level of schooling that's not compulsory in, in most places, and childcare. And you know, so there are a lot of differences. And right now, kindergarten, you may or may not have school-age childcare attached to that. And so, yes, I think I did say its purpose isn't for childcare, but we know whenever there's a strike, the first thing that comes up is, what am I going to do with mm. my child while I go to work? So I think the what I, my point was that we should look holistically across both sets of programs, whether it's in kindergarten and, or whether it's in childcare, and make sure that there are those common values and goals. And so that when a child is five and goes to kindergarten and their parent works till five o'clock, mm -hmm. that that's taken into account and that every school has um, you know, an extended day like, uh, you know, for, for those young children. Got it. Thank you. But I'm sure there's a much better way of putting it, Paul. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not very good with those ten a day type slogans that are, make a lot of sense. It's. Hi, um, I had a question about um, in your ten a day program. Do you have? Um, does it accommodate children with disabilities? Because obviously, those or have much more complex and more expensive needs? Absolutely, so the, I welcome you to grab a plan. You can see the details for that. But one of the accountability requirements is that the, um, is that the program supports full inclusion of all children with all needs. Um, and, in, and we do costing within the model that, um, that, uh, that allows for inclusion supports as well, supports and inclusion supports. So it's absolutely part of the program. So you mentioned the um, school age care, um, and I'm kind of curious about as you think about professionalizing the workforce, how, especially because that's kind of, um, it's inherently part time in nature, either before or after school care. And I think the same, some of the same issues occur in like after school programming <laughs> aspects of trying to professionalize that. So I'm kind of curious how, what kind of policies or suggestions you might have that might accommodate that to make it a legitimate like profession for some people if they choose. Yeah, I, I think that's sort of almost a whole other, you know, a whole other session. It is really complicated and it's interesting. In my short time that I was in Norway, I did think that this was one area of weakness that, um, so everybody's entitled to school age care, but it does, and it's all run by the municipal governments. Uh, but it is, it's not really regulated, it's not viewed as a profession the way it is uh, in that one to five. But they also believe that by the child, by the time a child is eight years old, they're going home by themselves. And you know, a number of parents I met who had seven year olds, they were in like grade two and there was no question but that they were fine going home and not being in, being in an after school program. And a government person that I met said, well, her grandchildren would never go to the school age program like they do something else because it's not very good. And it is problematic. I, I do think there are some solutions um, in Waterloo, Ontario, for example, where, the, and where they have educators and early childhood educators and school teachers working supposedly as a team, but not really, in kindergartens. And there's an extended day for kids. So there would be two educators, one would come Early start early in the morning, do the before 
school care and maybe go home at two o'clock and then the other staff would come at noon and work till six and so there's continuity for the children and a full-time job for the staff but it, it is complex and you know we do tend to focus on the, the younger children uh, to the detriment of school age children so lots and lots of work to do there well I'll just mention that the federal government uh, the, li the liberal government on, as part of their child care commitment actually focused on school age care. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet or how that will play out in the minority government, but um, you know, people are certainly raising that as an issue. Mm -hmm. well, one more question. Anyone want to be the, the person with the final word? Okay. Our deputy director. Um, I just want to echo what Paul said. Amazing to have you both here. Thank you for bringing your wisdom, experience, and passion. I guess the thing that really struck me was you both ended with a slide that was about some very big ideas that are a container in which childcare sits. Um, and so, Jane, you talked about sort of the importance of a child, as a child rights at the foundation of a system and seeing children as... Um, as people in their own right. Um, and I guess what I was intrigued by, Linnell, you finished with sort of the imperative, um, the degree to which that also needs to be a part of our message, um, that, that larger sense that this is simply the right thing to do because children, um, children in those early years are, are people and we need to, to, be, to, to be conscious of just addressing their needs because they are. And it sort of connects also with one thought I was having, which is, you know, from help. One of the things we talk a lot about is the EDI and outcomes at age five. And, and just that sense of whole child and that we're doing this because early child development is just a critical thing for us to be paying attention to as a society because we want to be thinking about civil society. So it's just sort of trying to connect the two presentations from that big sense of value. Maybe it's too big a question at the end, but feels like a perfect wrap-up question. Yeah. Anyhow, I, I, you know, I think um, it's interesting that you link those two, Pippa. So let, let Jane, you know, we, she gets a time to a little bit think about that too. But, uh, you know, from my perspective, the, the desire to bring in that last slide and link childcare to the, the really big issues that are facing us, you know, overall, um, there's a few reasons around that, but part of it is to help people realize that we are talking about something that is integrated with our success overall as a civil society. And I think that's what you're talking about. So, you know, we, we can tend to think of childcare as kind of a, I don't. You know, the, the joke at our dinner table years ago, somebody brought up something and I said, well, if we had universal childcare, we could solve that. And my son said, you think that universal childcare would solve everything? And I said, well, you're right, because it would. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I spent the rest of my time trying to prove that. But, so, but it is to keep the idea that it is central to addressing, you know, worldwide issues um, on the table, and it's not separate from them. It's part, it's part of addressing them. Um, and I think, you know, I'll turn to Jean, but I think the, the rights-based frame and, you know, what, how, how our children grow and develop is central to how we're going to survive as yeah, a absolutely. species, right? So, yeah, and I think, you've, I think you've said it all well. I don't really think I have anything to add to that, except, yes, it is the right thing to do, and we need to do it to, mm -hmm. you know, make sure we have a, all have a future. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Just, um, one thing before we show our appreciation, make sure you take all of your uh, cups and plates and so on with you uh, and dispose of them properly uh, outside of here so um, we don't have to do it. Uh, but let's uh, give a, uh, some appreciation. Thank you very much.